when you finish your film, there's no guarantee it's ever going to get off a shelf. You have to go find a distributor with an anchor attached to a rock. You're climbing Mount Everest. That's what making independent film is. Hey folks, Brian Smith here with Dream Path Podcast, where we get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. Today, we talk to movie producer Sunil Prakash. Sunil works on big budget blockbuster films like Salt starring Angelina Jolie and Enchanted starring Amy Adams, but he also works in the independent film world. And we talk to Sunil about why he operates in that universe. He is so sought after by major film studios working on $100 million films, $200 million films. Why would he want to work on a million dollar film or a $2 million film? where there are so many logistical challenges and there's no guarantees that the film is even going to make it off the shelves and, and be seen by audiences. And that's what I love about this chat with Sunil is we really dive into why he does what he does. Sunil shares some incredible wisdom from working decades in the movie industry about what it takes to put together an independent film, what it takes to collaborate on a big budget studio film how he makes his decisions on what scripts to work with and stories to develop and why he chooses to work with certain actors over and over and over again. His most recent film that we talk about quite a bit in this interview is called Last Survivors. It is a dystopian thriller starring Drew Van Acker, Alicia Silverstone, and Stephen Moyer from True Blood. I actually watched the entire film and didn't even realize that Stephen Moyer was one of the main characters that's how much of a chameleon Stephen Moyer is. A very impressive actor. But this is a great story. It's a unique story. In the interview, we also hear Sunil talk about how he made his way into film, his path into the film industry, which is a very organic path. So it's not like he went to film school and said, you know what I want to do? I want to become a movie producer. No, not Sunil. How he found his way into film was in a movie theater where he was watching Dances with Wolves. And after seeing the movie three times, he decided to just get in his car and drive to Hollywood and figure out how to get into the film industry. And that's what he did. And he stumbled across an amazing opportunity. I don't want to give away too many spoilers with this interview, but an amazing opportunity to work with Guillermo del Toro on his directorial debut of the movie Kronos. So that was back in the early 90s, and here we are decades later, and he has this amazing filmography, so much wisdom to share. So before we jump into the interview with Sunil Prakash, I just want to tell you that Last Survivors is out on video on demand. It still may be in select theaters right now, but for sure, if you want to find it, wherever you watch your movies, it's available, and uh, check it out. So let's jump right in to my chat with Sunil Prakash. Sunil Prakash, welcome to Dream Path Podcast. Pleasure to be here. How's your day treating you? Hey, not too bad. I was just telling Madison that uh, COVID is in my house, but it hasn't gotten me yet. So I'm kind of the last man standing in my own home. Are you isolating yourself? Are you like by yourself hiding in your pretty, little studio? Pretty much. Yeah, this, yeah. Is my, <laughs> this is my own little studio, my music recording studio and, and podcasting stations. So um, how about you? Have you, you and your family staying safe? Yeah. Um, uh, knock on wood, I've not gotten COVID yet. We went to the UK in the middle of a COVID surge for our world premiere at um, Fright Fest in Leeds. And pretty quickly, am I allowed to say this? We were like, it was just too hard. It was freezing out. So we sort of were indoor restaurants, indoor everything. Yeah. And no more masks. And we were fine. So I'm knocking on wood, you know? Yeah. Uh, was that for Last Survivors? or It was for Last Survivors, yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we world premiered at London's Leicester Square at Fright Fest. And honestly, like, the biggest sort of, like, question was, can we go in the middle of a COVID surge? It's right. a little, you know, um, but we did. Yeah, I think people are starting to just say, you know what, we have to live our lives and, you know, get out there at some point. And um, it, it was kind of disappointing to see Sundance go online this year. But after being at Sundance 
for for many years and realizing how tight those quarters are i mean that that would have been probably a really bad idea to in this surge to uh to do it in person but um you know you gotta go out and live your life you gotta live your life be safe be smart right but live exactly yeah it's tough it's tough um especially internationally you just don't know what's going to be going on you know on the streets in london at any given moment no and those streets of London were packed. Everything was packed. London was like there was nothing wrong. Even really? the train going up to the Leeds International Film Festival, there was a big sign saying, you must wear your mask on the train. We all wore ours. Not one Britisher was wearing their mask. And most of them were coughing the whole way through. <laughs> You're just, oh, goodness gracious. Okay, like, <laughs> like, this is really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I spend most of my time in central Washington state, even though my office is in Seattle. My primary residence is in the middle of Washington, which is kind of a, a there's a political divide between the east and west side of Washington state. You've got a very progressive Seattle area where every, you have to be vaccinated to get into any establishment and everybody wears masks. And then here in Yakima, it's uh, the opposite. I mean, it's it's almost like you, you feel um, self-conscious wearing a mask because nobody's wearing one, but I'll keep wearing them. I like it, actually. <laughs> I wear mine too. I, I, you know, I wear the one that they say actually protects you. It's not the KN95, but it's the um, four apply FDA surgical mask. They say it's like waterproof. So it's probably one of the best protections. I have no problem wearing it in an elevator. Like in the UK, I would just put my mask on if other people were in there. You get stairs, but it's, you know, again, be safe, you know? Right. So how did the premiere go with this film? I mean, look, it was incredible just because, A, it was we made the film in COVID. So all of this happening this past year and a half is just really, really amazing to be experiencing. Um, to, to go to London, uh, Stephen Moyer was there. Drew Van Acker was there. Alicia couldn't make it. She was shooting a film in Atlanta, but she was very much part of it and posting. Like, they're all very supportive of it. And um, just to see your film at a world premiere at a festival, a major festival, like Fright Fest in Leicester Square, uh, what, what's it called in Leicester Square? I mean, it was just awesome. Incredible. You know, that's amazing. Your, your Wi-Fi signal seems to be a little problematic. I'm, I'm hearing sure, you let me out do here. Thing. Um, let me... Wi-Fi, and I'm I'm old school, so I'm trying to learn all this stuff about how like you have to be, and I read the stuff. Is that a little bit better? Yes. I I, I hope so. Yeah, we'll see. If you cut out in the future, I'll let you know. Seems yeah. to be better. I just turned off. Yeah, let me know. Um, I'm technologically still from the '80s. I, I'm, <laughs> you know, I try to keep up. It's just hard. <laughs> yeah. So this film got made in COVID, and you being a producer, you are you know, I guess in deep into the rabbit hole of the logistics of making a film in a pandemic, uh, I would imagine that choosing Montana to shoot this film was strategic um, beyond just the beautiful scenery. Um, actually, there are these things called like tax rebates and film incentives out of states. Montana mm -hmm. had a very strong film incentive, which is what initially attracted us. And you know, the beauty of Montana really was a, a big part of it. You know, COVID was also in Montana, going to your point, everything was open in Montana. Um, you had to wear masks inside, but it was fully open. Restaurants, bars, you know, kind of like where we're at today. So um, we had really strict rules, though. Like we were not supposed to, we had to all, I mean, I'm the producer and I had everybody sign a pledge that you have to be really, really careful. No bars, no eating in restaurants you know, none of that. So, hmm. um, because, you know, COVID shutdown costs time and money and we're an independent film. So every day was a little bit like, you know, mercifully, no one's testing positive for COVID. Right. So tell me what that means to be an independent film producer and have an independent film. I know that it probably means independent from big studios, but what, what does, what does that mean exactly? Because um, I see you've worked on Salt. I mean, uh, I assumed Salt was a big studio film. Look, I, I watched it this week and I and, uh, was like, holy crap. That's, boy, those, those, those days of, of um, 
making films like that in huge public spaces with these uncontrolled environments. I don't know if we're ever going to get back to that again, no. um, <laughs> but obviously studio film, but, and now we're talking about last survivors, which is an independent film. What, what are the differences and how do you approach that differently as a producer? It's, it's two very different forms of filmmaking. And my background is doing studio films like Salt, Enchanted um, with Amy Adams. We actually did our sequel this year. We shot our sequel in Ireland over the summer uh, for Disney+. Plus. A studio film, they acquire the script. And in a sense, they're financing everything and they're marketing it, the distribution. So they're the money for every single thing. Now, you're still very involved as a producer creatively you know, not fighting with the studio, but you're there every day to make sure it's going creatively well, not over budget, all of those things. But ultimately, A, there's always a little bit more money if you run out. You know, it's studios, it's Sony, it's Disney. Um, so you have that in the back of your mind as long as you can convince them. Um, and then again, the marketing of the film, you know you're going to get a major release with a massive ad spend. Independent films, which I've been making a few of the last few years, I did this because it's the stories I love telling. It's harder to get them made at studios today. You know, they tend to like big IP Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. I love stories created from these young, interesting screenwriters as well. And in an independent film, you put the film together, you're struggling to find every bit of it from the director to the cast. And then you've got to find the money yourself which right. is a whole other ball of wax. And in this case, you know, we are a very modestly budgeted film. That's all you have. So, you know, if someone spills coffee on a costume, it's not like there's an extra $500 lying around to just redo <laughs> the costume, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so it's a very, I find it exhilarating. I love it. I find independent film um, I was telling all my good friends that, you know, work at the studios, there's something about where creativity is the only solution to a problem. It's never money. You mm -hmm. never like, for assault, enchanted, you could always throw a little bit of money to solve a problem, you know, and um, which is, listen, it makes my life easier, but there's something wonderful where ingenuity is what has to sort of, you know, come to the surface to make the day work. How do you straddle that line between studio filmmaking and indie filmmaking with um, your own business. I mean, you, you have um, your own production company, I assume. Yep. Yep. Uh, so what, what guides you in terms of where to spend your time and resources? Um, you know, it's an interesting sort of question. I definitely wanted to get into the independent space because that it's its own rules. And by the way, here's the other big one. When you finish your film, there's no guarantee it's ever going to get off a shelf. Like there's no, you have to go find a distributor and it's, it's, you're literally, it's like with an anchor attached to a rock, you're climbing Mount Everest. That's what making independent film is. Yeah. And um, I wanted to get in that space because I want to learn how to make movies and sell movies. This is my fourth indie film. I'm very, very proud of the film. I want to do bigger independent films. And I'm also someone who's like, when you're creating a business, you got to sort of go through it and learn it you know, it's a very different mindset on so many levels. So again, I've got, it was awesome for us to make our Enchanted sequel this year. I'm an executive producer on that film. Um, but I, I probably right now, my heart and soul is really, really building independent films, you know, um, mm. working with, you know, you know, because you're also now, while it's all very difficult, you're not at the mercy of a studio or a streamer saying yes, you know? Mm. So you still try to make movies there, but you know, studios like to develop movies. They like to do 40 drafts of a script and then decide they don't want to make the film, which is fine. That's <laughs> what they have the right to do. Um, I kind of want to, as I get older, I want to make stuff, you know, and good stuff and with right. interesting people. So it sounds like you're, you're kind of saddled with this corporate bureaucracy in the studio system. I mean, not to, I, I'm not trying to demean or, or disparage the studio system. It's just a different system with a lot of constraints creatively uh, in terms of like what one person can do and the influence they can have on the project. Whereas in an indie film, you can swoop in and, and just wear a lot of different hats and use your creativity to problem solve. And then you have this finished product and it's like, okay, now what, now what yeah. do we do? How do we get this thing seen and heard on, on various platforms and in theaters? Um, that's that's fantastic. Either. I mean, and, 
what's, what's really, really fun about Last Survivors, even being invited to Fright Fest, you know, uh, it, it's, and even Leeds, we, we, we did Fright Fest two-day Halloween uh, program. There were nine movies there. Six of the nine premiered at other festivals. This was a UK premiere. So one premiered at Sundance, one at Cannes, one at Fantastic Fest, two at Sitkiss, all really prestigious festivals. We were very, you know, we had a newer director, newer writer, a cast that isn't necessarily known for festival play. So it was really interesting to have even that opportunity, which then really attracted, you know, distributors. ICM, one of the major agencies came on, uh, they, they represent um, Drew Van Acker and Stephen Moyer. They came on to represent the film. They were very, very excited about it. And, um, but all of this is all not a guarantee. And we ended up, you know, getting a really good distributor. Vertical Entertainment um, is a top boutique distributor. They've really, really, you know, done a lot for the film, which is amazing. It's, it will get seen all over the world. They're selling it internationally. Um, you know, after, you know, it, it's, it's going to be everywhere, theaters and digital uh, on Friday. So it, it's, it's really, really heartening to see, you know, the momentum build. From those days in Montana in 10 degree weather where I'm like, where's the heaters and something <laughs> I can be warm in? And you're like, Sunil, there's no money for that. Like, so right. like, you know, it's a. That's funny. You know, so the, let's talk about distribution and distributors, because you're speaking a language that you're familiar with and your colleagues are, but my listeners probably don't understand the difference between a distributor and say, um, you know, a film studio, you know, what does a distributor do relative to all of the other uh, roles that are being played in the indie film process? A, a distributor releases the film and they, in general, technically pay the marketing as well. So they're, I mean, to get the film onto iTunes, Amazon, Fandango, all those digital platforms is, you know, you need a distributor who knows how to sort of do that and has relationships. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into distributing a film, big or small. Um, the studios are distributors. That's one of the big advantages of having a studio film. You know, you finish your film, now Disney marketing or Sony marketing takes it over. Um, and they have a lot more money, obviously, at the studios, you know, 50 to 75 million versus, you know, way less for a, a smaller independent film. But the distributor gets it out there. They, you know, and they do the marketing, the PR, all of those various different aspects to get your film, you know, as much profile uh, as possible. Um, one of the problems right now is I think there's too many independent films out there in the studios and streamers started making much bigger things everybody seems to be making independent films. So it's just very hard to break through the noise. And that is, I meet so many young filmmakers, um, you know, they just, you know, more often than not, I'm not going to do their script. I didn't respond, but even giving them advice, it's like, I'm not trying to be difficult, but I'm trying to say to them, but what, where does your movie end up? You know, how is this better differentiated? All of those different things you got to think about. In terms of accessibility of you, like accessing, Sunil, uh, you know, how, how do, how do people reach you typically? Is it through your representatives that, 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 you know, funnel projects down to something that you might be interested in? Um, so how do screenwriters and filmmakers, uh, get FaceTime with you? Generally in my career, it's people I meet. You know, and meet, you know, in Los Angeles, Kurt Wimmer, who wrote Salt, I met him at a party in 1993 and he gave me a card. He doesn't remember this. That said, Kurt Wimmer, screenwriter, you know, and I called him the <laughs> next day uh, and he claims that's not a true story. So we'll, we'll, we'll never know. Um, uh -huh. But um, uh, the fun of it is I generally meet people because it's, you know, agents send me scripts and projects all the time. I've most of my movies including Salt and Enchanted. Enchanted, I developed from scratch, ground up. Salt, a very early rough draft that doesn't resemble anything that we ended up with. So I tend to like to meet writers, get to know them, get to know their writing and or directors. You know, um, Drew Milleray, who directed uh, um, uh, Last Survivors, uh, it's actually the second film I've made with him. I met him, you know, viewed his shorts. We were in touch for six months before we actually ended up starting working together. So for me personally, I tend to like to get to know people. 
because you're taking a journey with the it's it's like taking a road trip with like five people so it's yeah. not five you want to know that you have a connection with them that can allow you to get to the end of the road so to speak right sort of well i noticed that too with the actors i'm looking at your filmography there's some common denominators there with drew and alicia and um you know i'm not sure about stephen moyer but it seems like you work with the same people um you know over and over again in some, you know in some films uh, I, I i've worked now with van acker on three movies we're actually producing a number of future projects together as well but when i met him on life like you know he looks like brad pitt but he's a really really strong actor mm -hmm. and that's the surprise he's smart he's you know, really, really dedicated to what he does. And when I find people like that today, I'm like, hold on to it and keep working with them. Because yeah. as I get older, I've done it. I've done a lot of different things and worked with, I've worked with, you know, Angelina Jolie, Sandra Bullock, Amy Adams. This is, I mean, I'm so lucky to have done that. But at this point, when I'm building my next step of the business, I really want to do it with people that like, you know, I know we're good. I'm less open to the unknown today as I get older, you know, right. like, yeah. um, and, uh, you know, uh, Alicia, we did blast from the past years ago. Uh, although when she came to Montana, she's like, I know we did a movie together years ago. I don't remember you at all, <laughs> 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 which she and I laugh about, um, Moyer, I had met, um, we did a Tom Cruise was attached to salt, uh, before we flipped it to a female and we did a table read at Sony and Moyer was actually part of the table read. So I had met him years ago. Mm. I didn't know him well, but it's, I think that's always helpful when you're trying to cast a film, if you have some connection to the actor, because it's just so hard to get actors, even if they love the material, it's just, it's a very interesting time where it's hard to get, you know, actors to want to do your movie for just a number of reasons, you know, especially in a world where so much television and streaming is going on, independent films, they sort of always have like a blinking green light, like they're almost there. Your money's there, but they're not really signing on the dotted line. So you're kind of playing this game where you're saying, oh, we're pushing a month, we're pushing a month, we're pushing a month. And you need cast that loves it, that wants to kind of go on that journey. Same with the director. Otherwise, it'll all just implode on itself. You know, going back to Drew, you you talked about how he looked like or he looks like Brad Pitt, and I I was thinking the same thing, except that he's a lot more chameleon like than Brad Pitt. And the problem with Brad Pitt, if this is a problem at all, it's a nice problem to have, I guess, is that he's always Brad Pitt. I mean, it's kind of like George Clooney. He's just there's this Clooney esque um, presence that Cl George Clooney has. Same with Brad Pitt. But Drew has that same, uh, you know, extremely handsome, you know, movie star quality type of guy. But you can be looking at him in a film like Last Survivors and not know that he's the same star of Lifelike or, you know, other films that he's been in or other TV shows. He's very like in terms of his age, sometimes he looks really young and sometimes he looks you know, old, I think that's a remarkable quality. I'm not sure you have control over it. Maybe it's just something you're born with, but it is remarkable about Drew. He works very hard to, to he's a passionate actor. Again, when we met him on Lifelike, it, what you think, and look, we, I say this with no disrespect. There's so many actors, actresses, and there are certain cliches of what an actor and actress is. Drew is not the cliche of what you'd think he would be. Because again, he looks a certain way, but he's a character actor. He reminds me a lot of Amy Adams. You know, she becomes the Amy Adams in Junebug is nothing like the Amy Adams is Enchanted, which is nothing like the Amy Adams in The Fighter. She's a character actress. Or even like Sissy Spacek, who I worked with years ago. Drew is a character actor, right. absolutely. And he loves loves to dive deep into the psychology of the roles and become the characters. And that's why he's like, you know, again, when you meet people like that, you want to work with them over and over. That's, that's great. Let's talk about your um, work on Enchanted, because you, you said that you worked on that from the ground up, like yeah. you, know, you developed that film, which is an amazing accomplishment because it's like, you know, it's one of the films that just will, will live forever in the library of children and adults. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I'm glad that there's a sequel coming out. But what do you mean by the ground up in terms of development? What is developing? What is involved in developing a film? And what is development? In that particular case, the writer and I, we'd actually, he'd written Blast from the Past, so I knew him well. 
Um, and we literally were like, what's the next thing we should do? And we really actually started as this idea, which is sort of funny, about like a nun leaving a convent. He actually wrote a draft of it and it just wasn't playing right. Like it was just, it just didn't work. We were trying to do something about like innocence, that no kids have innocence anymore. And then somewhere in the process, we sort of just were spitballing and we're like, what if it was like a Disney fair, not even a Disney character. Um, this was before it was a Disney, a fairy tale character. And that kind of clicked. And then we literally like, you know, come up with the beats together, work, you know, I work kind of hand in hand with them. And then we, you know, the finished script, we gave it to his then UTA agents. They really liked it. And we sent it out to a bunch of, I was young in my twenties, a bigger producer for each studio who has a deal at all the majors. And we ended up in a massive bidding war. We sold it to Disney, who then kind of converted it a little bit more Disney-esque. Like in the draft that we initially developed, she was hired as a stripper for the bachelor party. That had to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, um, but the smarts of the movie always retained. It was always supposed to be fairy tale idealism collided with almost like intellectual real world cynicism. The smarter we are, the less we feel and finding that balance between the two. Um, and then obviously we made the film for Disney. Kevin Lima, brilliant director, uh, did such a good job. I mean, he, he brought back all the original people who painted like Ariel and Belle and like really knew how to do the, he, you know, he'd come off of doing Tarzan. So he comes from Disney animation, but it was a lot of love. Uh, then Nina Jacobson, who ran the studio, went on to produce Hunger Games and Crazy Rich Asians. You know, she said, I want to make a classic out of this. And I give her all credit for like, it, I mean, it is a bona fide classic today. I agree. And what a pleasure. And again, so humble that it stood, you know, the, the, the test of time. So in terms of producing, um, and sorry to get, you know, kind of geeky with the vernacular and the vocabulary here, but when you see executive producer of a film versus producer or produced by, what do those credits mean? It, it, look, I got an executive producer credit on Enchanted because I was, I want to say 27 when I sold it. And so we made it years later, it took eight years to get made. Credits are often contractual. Generally speaking, the produced by credit is the main producer. But a lot of times, like, you know, like an indie film, someone will bring a little chunk of money, but they say, we want that credit. So the PGA is starting to, that little PGA that you see on credits, that doesn't mean they're producers guild. It means they were the main producer on the movie, like okay. as determined. And they're, you know, it's a bit of a diluted thing because sometimes there's exec producers who did more than the producers. Usually though, it's the producing credit is the best one, executive producer, second best one. Um, co-producer, associate. The other thing I'll say is like, you see Spielberg will executive produce something, which then means, you know, he's still very involved, but not day to day, you know, like, and he's lending his name or putting his name and using his company. And you see that often, like major people who want to, you know, take those executive producer credits. Going to Salt, uh, you talked about Tom Cruise being originally attached and then it switched to a female lead with Angelina Jolie. What prompted that switch in uh, narrative in the film and in stars. I mean, it was a pretty, pretty major difference in how that story is going to be told. And, um, and also the star, obviously uh, you, you have an equally amazing star in Angelina Jolie, um, kind of the equivalent of a Tom Cruise in, in the female lead, but how did that transition happen and why? Um, so it's a script that Kurt Wimmer wrote we developed, um, initially Kurt was going to direct it. This is 2005, I want to say. And it just wasn't getting off the ground. He directed something else and he's just like, Sunil, why don't we just let go of me directing it? You know, figure out something else to do. The script had actually been around. And this is one of my favorite stories. I was in post-production at Sony on Premonition. There was a young exec there named Hannah Mangella, who now is the president of JJ Abrams company. And I gave her the script saying, I'm working on this thing. It's old. It's like sort of been around. Everyone's seen it in the last two years. There may be some low ball option from Warner Brothers as a favorite of Kurt's agent. Some, it was some, it was just not click clicking. That night at our premonition screening, the chairwoman, Amy Pascal of Sony, walks up to me and says, I want to buy your script. And I'm like, hmm. what? I've not read it. Hannah read it at lunch, loves it. Do not like let me call you in the morning. The next day. 
I, I, the number may be wrong, but she ended up paying like two point eight million for the script. Wow! So it became when a studio back in that era bought a spec script for that kind of money, immediately everyone reads it, and that's how Tom Cruise was an incoming call. Um, he was attached for a year. I think again, I'm speaking for from purely my own opinion, but I always think somehow somewhere it was very similar to Mission Impossible. And he loved it. We had a bunch of meetings. It was awesome, but it just didn't work out. Our deal with them was such at Sony, they had to make it over a period of time. And it was Hannah Mangella, who at that point was, I want to say that then she was the president of Sony Animation. Then she was Columbia. But she said, what about Angelina Jolie? And my director, Philip Noyce, who's, again, incredible, did such a good job. He'd worked with Angelina on The Bone Collector. And he's like, absolutely, let's do it. Um, her manager knew all about the project because it was sort of a very well-known project. We sent it to her. She was in and there you go. <laughs> Going back to your days of Stanford University and economics and communications seems like kind of a, a, a reach or, a, you know, far away from the movie industry. But if you look at your work as a producer in terms of understanding the economics of film, I would imagine there's a a pretty close uh, nexus there between what you studied and what you ended up doing. Absolutely. Um, Stanford was very liberal arts, even economics. I mean, we did a little statistics and econometrics that gets a little number crunchy, but it was really liberal arts economics, you know, learning supply and demand um, uh, graphs and understanding all these theories. Communications, we had history of film, but it was also, there's a lot of theory in there. And then Stanford, at least when I was there, and I pretty from keeping up, they still do it. It's a very um, liberal arts education. Like, you know, you had to take philosophy and literature. So it was really a way to critically think and learn. And that to me was the best tool for, for Hollywood, for storytelling, for making movies, to understand, you know, and again, economics, it's a really smart way to think about things. And even in the communications major, we learned all about research methodology and like statistics. So like even Back when we do these huge test screenings on salt, I would be like, guys, um, that's statistically not significant to the standard deviation. I would sort of be like, I actually kind of think I understand this better than anyone else in the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my parents would be happy that my college education actually contributed to something. When did the idea of working in film uh, begin? Was that in college? Was it before you went to Stanford? I mean, I, I loved, I mean, we came from India when I was three. So um, this is the seventies. I, I, from seven years on when I, seven years old, I saw star Wars, maybe four or five times in the theater. I was mm. like, I want to make movies then. And my parents were immigrant doctors and they were like, okay, first you become doctor. Then you go make films, <laughs> you know, like, you know, when is the med school? I, they still ask me when I'm going to med school, but right. they're, they're retired at 86. Um, I always wanted to do that. My senior year at Stanford, I saw Dances with Wolves three times in the theater. I was so profoundly moved by the film. And I said, I have to just drive to LA and see what happens. And if nothing happens, I'll come back. But at least I know I tried. And um, mm. I got a job through a girl in my dorm, my senior dorm. Her father was friends with someone. He wasn't a well-known or even a known producer, but he had this little film he made was making in Mexico that was Guillermo del Toro's first film. So mm. I actually drove Guillermo around when I was like 22, right. um, you know, before he was, any, you know, Guillermo del Toro. And that's when I learned kind of what the journey of being a producer was. You have to know people. And I kind of went off on my own and spent a lot of time, you know, going to every class I could, like AFI, UCLA Extension, and then meeting the people who would come do the class. Like if it was an exec at Universal, it's how I met Nina Jacobson very early on. And start reading scripts and start developing and meeting young writers and understanding that this writer is better than those 10 scripts that I just read that sold on the spec market. And it started working very quickly for me. Like 24 was my first big sale to New Line. Mm -hmm. Wow. What, that sounds like a very organic way to start in the industry, just with that passion for film that was Star Wars and Dances with Wolves, and then you know just going directly to the epicenter of the film industry of Los Angeles, attending those classes. Um, that's incredible. And, and look where you're at now. I mean, making not only studio films, but also getting the best of both worlds and being an indie film as well. Absolutely. It's why the indie films are so gratifying, because it really is... My entire career, I kind of created, I always joke, 
I kind of did it's all for it all came from nothing. Like I didn't have like I always joke that no one returns my calls or emails if I wasn't sending them something they wanted to see or read, you know, like yeah. um, and I always say to younger people today too who are starting out in the industry that like, one of the best advice I ever got was from Nina Jacobson, where she said, be you know, differentiated, elevated, stronger, you know, you know, understand that like we're at Universal, we have a lot of producer deals, a lot comes our way. Why is what you send me going to be rise to the cream to the crop? You know, um, it, it's, it's all about like never forgetting you're competing in a marketplace when you're trying to succeed. I don't know why, but it's sort of like the thing I seem to say the most to newer people who are, you know, wanting to be actors, writers, directors, producers, and they kind of, it, it's maybe it's just a different vibe of our world or our culture, but be Darwiniangly competitive, you know, against everybody else because there isn't a slot for everybody. You know, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's. Are you finding that there are more slots though for folks now that the streaming platforms have uh, multiplied by, you know, a hundred and we're seeing I mean, so many different platforms? I, and I say this without sounding negative, but I'm going to actually say it's a little bit the other way because. What you see is like Hulu primarily is now just making movies. Fox is now Hulu. They, you know, they Disney bought Fox. Fox is making 14 movies for Hulu a year, you know, and they very much want to elevate what they're doing. This is from friends of mine at Fox telling me this. They'll still buy films in the second run, but it's way less. Netflix, you know, they make their own movies right now. If you look at Netflix, Hulu, they're not really buying a lot of movies out of festivals anymore. And even when you, you know, it, it, yes, there's all these different things like Paramount Plus and all these streaming platforms. But I, what I'm seeing, to be honest, is like, you know, people who already are making movies are making more movies. I actually wish there was more room for the newer. I mean, one of the things I really, really pride myself in all four of my indies were newer writers and directors, you know, like that no one had ever heard of. So um, it's, it's, I love when I met Kurt Wimmer or Bill Kelly, who wrote Enchanted, they were unrepresented. Um, again, when I met Drew Van Acker, he had some success on Pretty Little Liars, but not, he didn't have the recognition he has today. And I love nurturing newer talent. Like it's one of my favorite things to do. And I wish there was more, um, there was, frankly, more open to it and openness to it when I first came to Hollywood, because back then the idea was it doesn't matter where a good idea comes from. You know, you, you again, you look at Netflix, most of what they're doing and buying is what they make themselves. And I don't count the movies they licensed like three years ago for like 25 grand or whatever, you know, like an indie film. It's, it's definitely a model that's changing, you know? Yeah. Um, how, how does one become if you're giving advice to someone who wants to become a producer, they know they don't want to be in front of the camera. They maybe are not uh, why hardwired for screenwriting or directing, but they want to be in the film business, maybe as a producer. Is that something that you can aspire to do? Or do you just organically find yourself uh, producing films like you did just because of your passion and drive and your networking? Are you there? Yeah, I, I lost yeah. you for a second. Um, okay, yeah, your screen was yeah. frozen. Did you yeah. hear my whole question? I could yes, repeat I, my I question. I did hear the question. Okay. Um, um, say it again. Say the last half again. Oh, okay. My, my question was kind of a long one. Maybe I'll make it shorter. Uh, is, is becoming a, a movie producer something that folks can aspire to do and actually become uh, like for instance, at Tisch School of Arts in New York University, you can go to like a screenwriting program, yeah. or you know you can focus on actual filmmaking where you're directing your short and presenting it to your professor and sort of becoming a young filmmaker that way. Is there a similar path for movie producing? I mean, there are schools like I think UCLA has a producers program. USC has a very prestigious, but they're very small. I think the two things, if you want to be a producer, are you either need to find a great piece of material that you then own the rights to and or find financing. Those are the two places in the indie space. There's always look, there's always a traditional way where you can go be an assistant to an agent at one of the big agencies, get a job within the system. That is a way that you can climb up through the years as an executive. But if you want to produce like what I did, it's finding a great piece of material. Like maybe it's a 
a friend of yours wrote a novel and they're going to let you, you know, be a producer on it. Um, or, or again, a young screenwriter that wrote a really good script. But what I always say is like, if someone comes looking for what a great script is, you got to read a thousand scripts before you get a sense of what the marketplace in Hollywood is, you know, right. because technically anything could be great with the right execution. Does that make sense? So there's a little bit of a, like, I know five pages in whether the writing voice interests me or not, you know, of, mm -hmm. of the screenwriter. Um, and if it doesn't hit a certain level, I'll, I'll skim to 30. And then if the plot's not interesting, you sort of, you know, you, you know, right. as far as you get. Um, I, I, one thing I will say is I meet a lot of people who want to produce a lot of young people can raise money and they do the, you know, if you can raise money and or get the right project and meld it in the right way. And also understand that the first few things you produce, you're not going to be calling all the shots. Never make it about your ego. Learn what the game is. You can do very well, in my humble opinion. You know, mm -hmm. learn the in Hollywood is like Rome. Like when in Rome, do as Rome does. There's a culture to mainstream Hollywood. I say this a lot to people because I've done this now 30 years. You know, it's 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 never what people say. You know, if they say they loved your script and you never hear from them again, they hated your script. You know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> on the flip side, if they don't respond, but suddenly, you know, they're reaching out to you a lot. You, you it's, it's its own culture here. And I think, um, you know, especially with independent film, I mean, you can make a really good film for two to $300,000 with the right script, you know, and raise the money. And, and again, you know, look at what, look at what's playing, not only at the top six festivals, but Fantastic Fest, Fright Fest, Sitkiss, look at the top 30 festivals. It's really hard to get into the top six if you don't have prior, sort of relationship with the bigger festivals, you know, um, especially today. Did you read those articles that were saying that Sundance, you know, this year feels like a little bit of a, um, you know, a little bit like a lot of streaming films, a lot of Amazon and Netflix films were premiering there. Mm -hmm. So that sort of takes a slot away from an indie film. But again, your indie film could premiere like Fantastic Fest, get the right momentum behind it, and you could win big. And I think that's my biggest thing is that you can get whether it's a great piece of material um, or raising money or both, you can go very far with it. But always, I always say to people is just remember, why is it better differentiated? Like, how does it compete in the marketplace versus just you loving it? That would be my sort of biggest two cents. Yeah. So Last Survivors, what called you to that film, given that you have so many projects that are coming at you from many different directions, studio, indie, and uh, you chose this one you, and you were out there in the cold in Montana shooting this film. Why Last Survivors? I developed it from scratch as well. I was the writer of Lifelike. Uh, the writer actually directed Lifelike as well. Um, we, he, he was a friend of mine uh, for years and he came to me saying, I want to write. He'd written this one script that I helped him with. But I said, you're really good. Let's do something else. And he wanted to do something about preppers. His whole thing was, they're just fascinating. And we watched a bunch of videos and I thought there was something fascinating about people, doomsday preppers who believe the world is going to end and let's be ready. But we sort of took it more to that kind of like a metaphorical idea. What if somebody thought, have you seen the film yet, by the way? Or, oh yeah, I watched okay, it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. I don't want to give too much away to the audience, but what right. if someone thought that it's more a metaphorical apocalypse where humanity went bad? I love, even Enchanted, I love strong thematics to filmmaking. And I really like, I think the best movies feel simple, but underneath it all, there's layers and depth that some will choose to see, but it doesn't matter if you see it or not because it's mm -hmm. there, you know? Yeah. Um, so we were really, like, I'm very interested in that idea of our own humanity and our own hatred for humanity. And that's where this all came with this triangle and sort of what to believe and what not to believe. And yet at the end of it, there is hope in Jake, which again, you know, anyone who's seen my films, I've as yet to make a film with like a real downer ending, you know, like I, I do believe movies should leave you cathartically, like going to a better place in your day, you know? Yeah. This one definitely did. And and it is nuanced and it is layered and it poses some very interesting questions, but you know, great cast and a great story. And um, I, okay. I wish you all the best in, uh, you know, having this roll out in theaters and on VOD. I, I appreciate that. And the cast, look, again, it's a small film in Montana. 
Uh, Alicia was uh, joking the other day in an interview about how like her triple banger smelled like manure. And it really did. <laughs> this is a, there was no, I mean, there's no creature comforts here on salt. When we did the snow, we would be in these huge tents with these like heating stones. It was very lovely. You know, this was the elements in Montana and everybody who went to the film, we shot it in 18 days. They were there to just make that movie. There were days where the crew, including me, including Van Acker, were carrying equipment halfway up a hill to get to that little moment with a secret spot. You know, it was mm-hmm. really, it was really amazing to see everybody. Our DP did such a beautiful job. Our director, Director Milray, um, you know, every day just rallying despite that. There's a scene where um, uh, Troy takes Drew back to the secret spot. It was a white out snowstorm and uh, <laughs> it was back up that hill. That's like a 15 minute walk with the equipment yet, you know, everyone went and um, it looks, it actually looks like we're a big budget film, you know, creating this like on a stage or something, which I love. Um, it does. The, the cameras that are available to indie filmmakers now are so much uh, better than they used to be, you know, and now you can make a film that looks like a studio film yeah. on a very low budget. Mm -hmm. But I also want to say on this one, because of COVID, I think we made a bigger film. Everyone just got paid a lot less. Like people were willing, right? you know, it's, it's the cast all took, you know, the the passion was there. The DP brought his own lenses. I think in a non COVID thing um, uh, arena, people would be, you know, people would be a little bit more like, let's pay a little bit more, you know, like our hair and makeup was one lady. uh, I've worked with her twice before. She brought a ton of her own stuff, you know, like to make the blood and all that stuff look really good. So a lot of passion and sweat equity. Nice. Are you going to work with Wimmer on the, the sequel of salt? I saw that you're developing that or it's in the works at least. It's in the works. Let's see if that happens. You know, we, I was sort of surprised we've been working on our enchanted sequel for so many years right before the pandemic, it became very real, you know, which was amazing. Um, I, 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 it'll be, I, I, I don't know whether it will actually happen. And there's been talks of doing all sorts of things, you know, salt TV, salt sequel, let's see what happens. But um, Wimmer is at this point, not working on it. Um, but mm-hmm. I'm working with Wimmer on other stuff. He's still a good friend and, you know, all of them, Philip Noyce, Kevin Lima, they're all, I love, you know, these journeys you take with these filmmakers and they become lifelong, lifelong friends. Well, I learned so much talking to you, Sunil, and I appreciate you sharing your time with us and your story and your journey. A pleasure. Have a great day and thank you. All right. Good luck with the film. Thank you so much. Take care. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.